Sepsa Talk. I am Evans Apia Kisi, the host of Sepsa Talk. Sepsa is Center for Better Society Advocacy and Research Africa. Sepsa Africa is a nonprofit organization that believes in a better society for all. We in Sepsa Africa believe that a better society begins with you and I. Hashtag a better society begins with me. For more information, please log on to www.sepsaafrica.org. Follow us on the various social media platforms, YouTube, Sepsa Talk, Facebook at Sepsa Africa, Instagram, Sepsa Africa, and Twitter at Sepsa Africa. Like always, today, we bring you another interesting discussion on our series of interrogating the manifestos, a focus on agriculture and agribusiness. Like most African countries, Ghana operates an export-oriented agriculture and domestic food production. In both systems, Ghana needs to sustain and scale production, though much more is desired in the domestic production sector in order to meet the rising local demand, particularly with the disruption of global food supply chains as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Through this episode of SEPSA Talk, we want to know how promises found in party manifestos are able to boost agricultural productivity in Ghana. We identify what gaps exist in the manifestos aimed at promoting sustainable agricultural production. We want to understand what actions should be put in place by the next Ghana government in 2021 onwards towards thriving agricultural and agribusiness sector. These are many other questions we'll be discussed here on SEPSA Talk today. It is important before I introduce my guest to note that the discussion is not to pitch one manifesto against the other in terms of superiority, but to look at how the promises address the desired level of agricultural and agribusiness transformation needed as a country. And to help us deal with this important discussion are Mr. Haruna Gado Yakubu, is an animal nutritionist and feed safety engineer, is a research fellow at SEPSA Africa, is a research assistant at Near Infrared spectroscopy laboratory at the Kamtova University, Hungary. He's a PhD student in animal science, doctoral school of animal science, Kakosva University, Hungary. He holds MSc in animal nutrition and feed safety engineering from the same university and holds a BS in agricultural science from the University of Cape Coast, Ghana. His expertise lies in animal nutrition, feed safety and rapid analytical technologies. I'm so excited to host you once again. Welcome to SEPSA Talk, Mr. Haruna Gado Yakubu. Thank you, Evans, for having me again. Great. And our next guest is um, Mr. Yao Safo. He's currently a PhD student at the George August University, Germany. He was MSc in Sustainable International Agriculture from the same university in Germany. And he holds BSc in Agricultural Science from the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, Ghana. His research focus lies in agricultural finance. I must say that it's a pleasure to host you and welcome to SEPSA Talk, Mr. Yao Safo. Thank you very much, Mr. Kisi. Great. On your program. Great. And um, I must also say that as usual, this program is being streamed live on Facebook at SEPSA Africa. And for those of you who follow AK Mensa also, he would be sharing that on his wall together with others who would be doing so. So without wasting much time, let me, let me issue this disclaimer here. So like we've been doing in the past weeks, today, Yao Safo would focus on that of the NDC's manifesto. 
And then Haruna Gado Yakubu would also focus on that of the MPP's manifesto. What we are doing is to interrogate how their promises, you know, in or for the agricultural sector is, is able to transform that sector. It's important to note that they do not speak nor represent these political parties. It's an intellectual discussion that we are having in order to help move Ghana forward. So gentlemen, welcome once again to SEPSA Talk. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. So like we've been doing, we always start with that of the MPPs and uh, I'll start right away with you, Haruna. So if you look at the MPPs manifesto, if you can kindly give us a structuring of the manifesto with regards to agriculture and agribusiness, which areas of agriculture and agribusiness do you feel they touch on or feel to consider? Thank you. Thank you, Evans, for having me. And it's a pleasure to share the, the, the show with Mr. Yahosafo for the first time. Evans, the NPP manifesto is crafted within the context of the overall vision of the Ghana Beyond Aid. Of course, they are targeting achieving the sustainable development goals with the general principle of tapping into the private sector for delivery of the public services. NPP is a right-wing political party, and this is expected to use the public private partnership approach. So as a government seeking re-election, it is expected that the structure outlined in the manifesto will involve already existing programs or projects in the agriculture sector that will be continuing in the, in the next uh, administration. Some of the targeted areas, if you like, areas that the next administration will continue. Uh, if we look at sector by sector basis within the agriculture overall sector, uh, in terms of input supply, they promise to use the five model approach, which is currently in, in place. By five model approach, they have supplying input through the planting for food and jobs, rearing for food and jobs, planting for export and rural development, the food crop components, greenhouse villages, and the agriculture mechanization cent uh, centers. So these are the models through which they they, they, they promise to supply inputs. Already they are into sharing of inputs like seed and fertilizers. But if you look at this model, what is the major challenge? So far we have, we have reports that, for instance, the fertilizer is being smuggled into other countries through the planting for food and jobs program. When we move for, when in, in the subsequent submissions, we'll see how, in my recommendations, how this can be, can be solved. Again, they promise to revive the Greens and Legume Development Board and support private sector seed growers to increase supply of these inputs. So what are they doing and what are they promising to do? So far, they have resourced the uh, development of foundation and breeder seed. Foundation and breeder seeds are very essential in the development of certified seed. So they are trying to look at how they can develop certified seed for our farmers to have it instead of importing. So trying to lead as relating, uh, try, trying to lead as related growth of the green production sector in Ghana. If you look at the uh, fertilizer subsidy policy, ready the planting for food and jobs initiated a 50% subsidy on seed and fertilizer. And they are planning to also continue on that. Again, they also promised to look at uh, revolutionizing the, the, the farm extension officers uh, program under the extension uh, services. They've already recruited significant number of extension officers into the field, and they are trying to bridge the gap of the UN recommended one extension officer to 500 farmers. So for now, we are not doing that. We are doing above a little above 1,000, and they are trying to reduce the gap approaching the UN recommendation. A very significant uh, focus that they are looking at in the disease control area is to increase the surveillance of the occurrence of pests and diseases. Evans, it's very important to note that on the 1st of June 2019, the Minister of Food and Agriculture has placed an indefinite ban on the export of capsicum species. We talk of the, the pepe, solanum, talking of tomato, lufa, talking of the cucubitaceae family, and all leafy vegetables, because our vegetable products are not meeting that of the EU standard. So it's very important that they are considering increasing the disease control component in the agriculture field. They also promised to continue improving wire housing and post harvest logistics. This will support again the selected product with storage transportation, uh, transportation, marketing, and distribution. 
This they promised to execute through the One District, One Wirehouse initiative. So looking at the policies they have in place, they are just begging Ghanaians to again give them the other, another opportunity so that they can continue them. Let's look at what is very interesting when you come to the export vision of, of the manifesto, the NPP manifesto. Mm. So they are trying to diversify export-oriented large-scale agriculture enterprises. You look at cocoa, palm oil, the, the legumes, cereals, rice, horticulture, produce, poultry, meat, and other regional markets. So it is important to mention here that they want to use a specific tool to promote this diversification. There is a, 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 uh, a tool in place called the Ghana Commodity Exchange. Mm -hmm. This Ghana Commodity Exchange has been established since 2018. And what is it about? It's a public-private partnership with the government of Ghana. And the Ghana government is the sole shareholder for now. The aim of the exchange is to establish linkages between the agriculture and the commodity producers and buyers as well to secure competitive prices for their products. Thus, they are assuring market quantity and quality as well as timely settlement of the trade. So this is very important for us to increase our trade partnership in the agriculture sector. I will focus now on uh, animal production. In animal production, they are promising supporting the private sector under the rearing for food and jobs so that we have a policy subsidy program for day old chicks. Evans, this is very disheartening. Ghana currently imports over $300 million worth of chicken annually. That's about 180,000 metric tons or the equivalent of 5 million chickens each week. The country's own production that if you look at what is being produced domestically is 58,000 metric tons. Whereas the national demand is about 400,000 metric tons. So you can see the differences in, in demand. So it's very important that they are considering something under the rearing for food and jobs policy to subsidize the old chicks, uh, promote their production. So they are going to use the Ghana incentive based risk sharing system so that they promote this and already ADB is involved in the lending in the lending program. Again, they have instituted and they are trying to strengthen the anti-dumping measures on poultry mm. that is currently in place so that people will have permit system introduced to regulate the importation of poultry products. In the small ruminant production chain, they are trying to improve that again. They promise to increase the establishment of livestock development centers in the three agroecological zones. So far we have 11 and they are trying to improve on that. Promotion of cattle ranching. And this is very, very important to me, Evans. Evans, when I started writing about agriculture policies in Ghana, coming from the Northern region, I wrote significantly on how we can help promote cattle ranching so that we will have even, we will know the number of cattle that we are rearing in the country. And we'll have a very good system regulating the impasse that is happening between farmers and, and uh, the Flanny Hessmen. Mm. So here they've, they've already started developing some cultural ranching system in Afran Plains and they promise to increase that as well. The last component that I'll be looking at in the structure is agriculture financing and the cocoa area. So in the agriculture financing aspect, they promise to increase the access of finance through what they call the Ghana incentive based risk sharing scheme. If you recall our last uh, my last uh, appearance on this show, I spoke about agriculture financing and we all agreed about the risks associated to lending policies in the agriculture sector. So they are trying to introduce the Ghana incentive-based risk sharing scheme. So this scheme will be a form of non-banking financial institution incorporated as a private company in Ghana. And their objective will be to direct agriculture financing by the financial institution that will be providing it. So it's just sharing a linkage between the financial institutions and the farmer. Mm. So le let me conclude by looking at the, the cocoa sector that we are very much uh, uh, focused on in, in Ghana. When you talk agriculture, the main area that we are looking at is the cocoa when it comes to Ghana. So already they've expanded some local productions in, in the country and they are promising to increase the local processing of cocoa from 20, now currently we move from 27% to 40%. So they're trying to increase the, the local processing of cocoa in the value chain from 40%. They've not given us the targeted uh, percentage that they are looking at. Again, they've already instituted some plans to establish indigenous processing factories. And this would be very good if they consider that in the next administration in case 
they, they are able to win the election. This is just interrogating their manifestos. When they are able to do this, then they increase value to the cocoa, creating jobs as well. They've already reintroduced the compensation program mm. and they are promising to continue as well. So in, in, in summary, this is what the structure is. Mm. When we come to the gaps, then we look at what is missing. Thank you, thank you very much. But just um, a quick follow up um, on what you said. So you have given a summary that if you look at the MPP's manifesto in the area of agriculture and agribusiness, they seem to have touched on virtually a lot of areas in, in agriculture, particularly focusing more on private public strategy, as you said, and it's more of the input supply um, driven. Do you feel that there is, I know we'll come to the gaps, even the things that they have talked about, but you feel there is you know, any particular area that they failed to consider, maybe forestry or fishing or all of these areas you feel has been, you know, considered? Yeah, fisheries, uh, sorry that I didn't mention this, fisheries has been considered into detail. Forestry was also considered, but my problem with forestry is that it was limited to, to just uh, looking at the youth in forestry program. When mm. we come to the gaps, I will speak about the, right. that the same. So with, with fisheries, if I will just complete this, fisheries for now, they are trying to enforce the fisheries management uh, policy. That is the Fisheries Act of 2002, Act 625. So they are trying to stop what we call petroling and also other illegal fishing methods. So petroling for now has been banned in many major uh, fishing countries. So implementing this policy to reduce the, the devastating effects of some fishing method is what they are focusing on now. Mm. And uh, they, are, they, are, they, they are promising. All right. All right. Thank you very much. So quickly, I come to you, um, Mr. Safo. Same question. If you look at the NDC's manifesto, if you can give us a summary of the structuring of it as far as the sector agriculture and agribusiness is concerned. Okay, thank you very much. In the NDC manifesto, like already indicated by my, my learned colleague, Gado, the agricultural sector is important to Ghana's economic growth and development. And based on the Ghana statistical service indicators, it contributed about 21% to the national GDP in the year 2017. And it also employs about 36% of the adult population. However, the challenge with the agricultural sector is as at now, we find it very difficult to realize the full potential of the agricultural sector. And it's as a result of this, that is why the NDC focuses on agricultural and agribusiness as the focal point of is Ghana's economic development and, and growth. So looking at the NDC's policy, NDC's manifesto, sorry, they've considered various areas of agricultural and agribusiness upon which they could really target and develop in relation to agriculture and agribusiness development. So for instance, one area that they've really placed emphasis on is about the cocoa production. As already indicated by my friend in Ghana, if we talk about agriculture, it's about cocoa production because that is where we earn the greater share of our foreign esteem. So what does their manifesto say? So one, they want to ensure consistent annual increment of cocoa prices to the farmers. And during their time, they were also sharing um, free fertilizer and also agro input. And it's a policy that they want to restore. And in relation to revamping the aging and cocoa trees, they want to supply about 100 million free hybrid seedlings to cocoa farmers per year, so every single year. And they also want to establish additional cocoa colleges for the training of cocoa farmers and extension offices. 
And looking at the Adekuko farmers, their health is also of paramount importance to the next NDC government. So they want to offer farmers free health care, especially in, in, in cocoa clinics. And they also want to implement the a pension scheme for cocoa farmers where farmers would have a pension at the end of, of their service or beyond a certain age. And there are also strategies to combat the use of child labor in the cocoa value chain, as it has already been indicated in some development contexts that there are issues with child labor when it comes to cocoa production. And there are also strategies to also improve on the on roads and transportation in in this cocoa growing areas and in respect of control of pests and diseases they also have strategies to combat the fall army worms of of cocoa farms and in all that they also want to empower women when it comes to cuckoo farming. So by offering them training and giving them the necessary support. If I may just come in, I mean, if you, as um, Haruna rightly put it, if you look at the MPP's manifesto, they seem to have covered virtually almost all the subsectors of, of, of agriculture. Is it the same also in that of the NDC's manifesto? Do you do you find that they, they cover areas such as uh, animal production, fishing, and also forestry? And yes, land? yes, they've, they've tried to cover like a lot. So in the next slide, I explain that if you permit me. So for instance, in the use of um, fertilizer, they have a policy for um, fertilizer production so the government will support local companies mm. to formulate and produce fertilizers locally in order to enhance affordability and also job creation. And when we look at job creation, for instance, they've est estimated that about 30% of school leavers in will be employed in the, or will be encouraged to join the agricultural sector. And they've also planned to, to put about 60,000 hectares of land in various districts into agricultural production just to create employment for people. And in relation to agricultural finance, as mentioned by Gado, the NDC budget seeks to increase direct budget expenditure on agriculture from the present 7% um, 7 7 to at least 10%. Enhance um, foreign direct investment and also incentivize financial sector to devote sizable amount of credit to primary agriculture and agri and through the ESM Bank, they also want to restructure rural credit to, in order to address or meet the financial needs of key strategic agricultural and agribusiness activities. Okay. And um, in relation to irrigation, because Ghana's agriculture is mainly rain fed. So they've, they've put in strategies to develop and construct irrigation dams across the country to enhance all year agricultural production. And this also they will do through the support of ESM Bank. Maybe, maybe not to cut you at short, I, I guess that we, we get a totality. I mean, if from what Yao is also saying, it's pretty much the same, and this has been the, the the status, you know, throughout our interrogation of of the manifestos. That usually they are similar. So you say that, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but the NDC's manifesto, of course, also touches on virtually 
the various subsectors of agriculture, even though the emphasis is placed more on cocoa, which, which of course is understandable given the explanation that, that you, you gave. Very good. So we continue because then this is what is important for us. I mean, and I start with you again, Gado Yakubu. What are the gaps? I mean, if you look at the manifesto, it's spelled out quite well. It looks promising, as you said, as others have also said. What are the gaps do you identify in them in terms of these promises, you know, helping to achieve a sustainable agriculture and agribusiness sector that we desire as a country? What gaps do you identify in the MPP's manifesto? Thank you, Evans. Evans, before I go on with the gaps, just permit me to, to, to commend Cocoa Board. In fact, we have been a critic of Cocoa Board and it's just courtesy or with respect, I have to commend them for doing a very significant policy revolution in the Cocoa area. So with the living income differential under the Ghana Cocoa Divoir Corporation, Cocoa farmers will now be ending $400 per ton. This is a huge impact in the Cocoa area. So I commend Cocoa Board on that. What are the gaps? First, when you look at agriculture, the youth bulge in Ghana significantly has a role to play or they have a role to play in, in agriculture. The vision for youth and women development in agriculture under this manifesto is not well delineated. If you look at the role of the youth, always this, these two political parties put them under afforestation, planting of trees. To me, this is a huge gap in the agriculture value chain. When you are focusing on youth development in agriculture, they must be from the starting point of production to value addition and even to marketing. They must be that chain. So when you look at this manifesto, yes, it is true that with the current plan or the current uh, greenhouse project that even started uh, in the last NDC government that this government has continued and finished significant number of them, they are employing the youth. That is huge. But as a country basically getting its revenue from agriculture, youth development and women in agriculture, you know, I'm gender biased, must be included in the manifesto. They must look at how they can involve the youth from the production to the end producer. Youth development is key. Again, the vision for agriculture education and training is largely missing. I've gone through the education sector of the manifesto. I've gone through the agriculture sector, trying to see whether they will place even agriculture education under education or agri. We have about five training colleges focusing on agriculture that are being mentored by the University of Cape Coast. I know the University of Cape Coast time to time try to review the curriculum of these colleges, but with infrastructure development and in-service training after, after they've graduated, government must have a very clear-cut policy to at least develop these potentials that are in the training, training colleges. For now, they are not even enjoying the, the, the so-called restored allowances. Government must come clear on that. They must tell us the vision they have for the five training colleges. Ag agriculture extension is very important. For instance, even in the Pont Tamale uh, school, they don't only focus on, they don't even focus on agriculture extension, it's on based on agri uh, animal production and veterinary services. So the manifesto, if they, they even manifestos are just promises, but when they, they get the opportunity to, to money their country again, they should focus on agriculture education and training. Currently, even at the basic education level, agriculture education is not being considered as a subject. Some of us had the opportunity to, to, to do agriculture as a subject on its own, and that motivated some of us to pursue it to the higher level. Again, there is no clear cut mention of how the next government will harness the potential of climate smart agriculture or precision agriculture. In Ghana, when you talk about climate smart agriculture, their focus is just on greenhouse production. Yes, greenhouse production is one of them, but there are many many areas that you can consider. ICT, the information communication technology has developed significantly in the world and people are harnessing the potential of information communication technology in agriculture. Yes, in the health sector, we've seen Zipline having the drone policy to supply health uh, medications or inputs in the health sector. But when you come to agriculture, what are the potentials? The manifesto didn't clearly uh, capture that. Again, suffice to say that the previous administration, this government has some 
greenhouse project. Mm. And lastly, to, to, to mention, when you look at the structure of the manifesto generally, expected, it's expected because they are in government and they are wishing to have other, another chance. They are just trying to continue the policies they've started to see the targets that they will achieve. When we come to my concluding remarks, I will have some things to suggest and to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Haruna Gado Yakubu. So, for you, the gaps, you know, ranges from a neglect as far as the role of the youth is concerned, and neglect also in the area of value addition, marketing, and also you talked about also no vision for agricultural education in the various agricultural colleges as well yes. as. Um, silence on climate smart agriculture and yes. precision agriculture yes just one follow-up question on this youth thing i i mean but what do you say to people who also say that usually you you the 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 youth of today i mean maybe not of today since time in memoria have not shown any interest in agriculture so why should we waste our time in crafting policies and you know programs to to be able to attract them or because they, they, they simply are not interested in agriculture. They just want quick money. So, <laughs> yeah, even as you are right, even, even some critics tell me that, oh, you speak always on agriculture. You write on agriculture, putting it on Facebook, but you yourself, what are you, are you doing? We should understand the value chain in agriculture. In agriculture, we have those on the ground doing the production. We have the researchers doing the research and also the, uh, giving the information out to extension officers to be given to this uh, production unit. Yes, it is true that some of us are in quote and in tie talking about agriculture, but that is an aspect of agriculture. There are other places that we can look at. How can we motivate the youth? Yes, when you look at the, the policies in place now, like the uh, planting for food and jobs, I, I, as I said, if I come to the concluding remarks, I will talk about the gaps in that policy. When you look at it significantly, it gives uh, credence to those in the agriculture value chain to tap into the input being supplied. Mm -hmm. We should reserve an amount. We should have some percentage of this input going to targeted youth. We should have age bracket that must benefit from, let's take, take for instance, we are setting 10% of those input aside for the youth. Let's encourage them to come and take the input and the subsidy policy to, if we want them to benefit, if it is 50 in the general population, let's reduce it, for instance, to 40 or 35 for a particular youth bracket. I know when you talk about youth, even in Ghana, the 70 year old will tell you I'm, I'm youth. So that would be a problem. I can delineate the age, for instance, from, from 20 to 35, you should have some benefit if you want to go into, into farming. Mm -hmm. Again, in our schools, we shouldn't see agriculture as punishment when teachers are using agriculture to punish people, if you, you, you come to school late and it's give you the hoe and cutlass to go and work. People usually think that that is a form of punishment. Yes, it is true that in doing that, you, you, you pay back something to the school, giving the school opportunity to use you as a, as a laborer. But I think that is not even happening now. And going forward, we should look at giving incentives to attract specific, specific age brackets into the agriculture value chain. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I come to you, um, Mr. Yaosafo. Same question. When you look at that of the NDC's manifesto, what, what gaps do you feel exist in them as far as promoting sustainable agricultural production is concerned? Okay. Thank you. Um, I think I identified four gaps in relation to the NDC manifesto. The first one, I will look at rice production. Currently, Ghana spends about $331 million on rice importation annually, based on the Ghana Export Promotion Authorities and Statistics of Figures. And this accounts for about 50% of, of rice consumption demand in Ghana. However, the People's Manifesto or the NDC's Manifesto fails to show concrete road plan or roadmap as to how this could be addressed. Yes, they gave an indication that well, we would we will help improve rice production, but as to how they would do it is not very clear. And second, in respect of agricultural finance, the People's Manifesto indicates that we would minimize credit 
race to agriculture and agribusiness sector. But how do they achieve this? They've always emphasized on the use of ESM Bank. However, ESM Bank is normally in the, in the regional capitals, maybe in Accra, for instance. And how do they provide these financial services to people in rural areas? This is not also clear to me, in my opinion. And in respect of employment, as already indicated, the People's Manifesto suggests to attract about 30,000 and um, about 30% 30 of school leavers into agriculture and agribusiness activities. So how is this feasible? Ghana currently produces about 100,000 um, students a year, like graduates a year. So how is it possible to attract 30% of these graduates into the agricultural sector? And how do we also get the needed human resource to develop other sectors of the economy? And finally, there is also a suggestion about implementation of um, cocoa farmers pension scheme. It's a very nice idea. I'm in full support of it, but how do they do it? Do they have a minimum increase size with which a cocoa farmer can join the scheme? How do they plan to do it? There is very little information or no clarity on that. Yeah, so these are the four, I think, gaps that I identified. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Yao Safo. I guess I missed the third one. I, but I mean, the first point you talk about the neglect um, on rice production because it takes a chunk of our, of, yes, of, of, our, of our agricultural budget as far as export and imports are, are concerned. And you also talked about agricultural finance, which I would yes. definitely be interested to hear your thoughts on how well that could be, what kind of actions could be put in place to you know, address this main challenge, that's the agricultural finance. And then the last one I got was the implementation of the cocoa uh, pension schemes. Yeah, so I think the third one is the employment. Okay. Just to suggest they would want to attract about 30% of school leavers into the agricultural sector, but how do they do this? Okay. Okay, so when you look at the very well, so the, your last two points concerns more of the how, how they are able to implement this. This is not clear. But maybe just a follow up question on the rice production thing. I mean, I think recently we saw that there was some kind of massive campaign for, uh, you know, consuming domestic rice and, and the likes. There are others also who criticized it for, for its quality and, and, and the rest. Maybe if you look at issues of comparative advantage, should it really be a focus as, as a country? Do you think that what if we would get it at a cheaper price in Thailand or in China? Why, why shouldn't we focus you know, on maybe cocoa or something that we, we have, so to say, comparative advantage over instead of putting our resources into rice production that the, the local people are not interested in consuming? What, what do you say to that? Yes, um, I agree to your suggestion on the comparative advantage. However, given that we spend a greater majority of our budget on rice importation, I think it's in the best interest of the country to really have a closer look and develop strategies in improving rice production and also, especially with the processing. Many a times people complain about the <clears throat> about the presence of debris and stones in the, in the local rice. So if we could really focus on improving on the quality, I think with time people's preference could change and develop mm -hmm. very good interest in the, in the local rice. And this could save the country a lot of, a lot of money and also help us to um, stabilize okay. our, our currency. All right, thank you very much, um, Mr. Yao Safu. Thank you very much, Haruna Gadu Yakubu. So if you are joining us live or if you are just joining us, this is Sepsa Talk. Today we are 
as usual, interrogating the manifestos. We are looking at that of the MPP and that of the NDC, and we focus on agriculture and agribusiness. And our guests have been Mr. Yao Safu, who is focusing on that of the NDC, and Haruna Gado Yakubu, focusing on that of the MPP. But mind you, they do not represent nor speak for these political parties. So I have a couple of messages here. One from Bennett Amwa says, I'm watching you. One from Mausi Nuklu says, PhD Al Safo. But there's this one from Zeke HN. He has some questions for you guys here. He says, thank you, Mr. Haruna. I have a question for you. It is true that we are in interesting times with COVID-19 pandemic. With a recession hitting a country like Nigeria under one regime, knowing that Ghana being the next stronghold of the continent, what do you think is the direction Ghana took concerning import and export of agricultural produce, enhancing different areas of agriculture as well as implementing policies in order to avert crises related to agricultural productivity, unemployment, hunger, and starvation, which is directly targeted at there? I think this would be pretty much the second round question. I mean, yes, exactly. He has he he has already. I think entered, he has instigated me to give my concluding remarks. Yes. So so thank <laughs> you very much, Zeke. Stay and watch my me. concluding remarks. Yes. And then he has the second question: How is the Ghanaian institution dealing with agriculture import and exports to overcome the challenges posed by COVID nineteen in relation to pre existing economic and political factors? Um. I think this could all be summed up in your concluding remark, as well as the second round, when we look at what actions you feel should be put in place to, you know, uh, transform our agriculture and agribusiness sector. Yes. There's also another question from one Jesse Amprak, which says, looking at how COVID-19 has worsened the situation of workers engaged in global supply chains, what are the provisions in the NDC manifesto to protect the NDC and the MPP's manifesto to protect workers in agri-food supply chain in case of future pandemics. So I think this is about workers, I mean, the welfare of workers. Maybe for this question, I don't know if you would want to have a bite on. I feel the other questions feeds into our second round where we look at actions that should be, or that could be taken to enhance agricultural uh, uh, sector being sustainable and also being transformed. But this is with the issue of workers. You feel there is something that can be done to help save smallholder farmers as far as this COVID-19 is concerned. Yes, Evans. And if you look at the MPP manifesto, there is a section that uh, talks about the, the, the structure of the general economy, what they've done during the COVID-19 pandemic. It's true that the stimulus package that government give out is in terms of the, the, the volume is huge, but in terms of distribution as farmers or even those involved in SME, they get very small amount and some of them are complaining. I think currently, if you look at our borrowing and our debt stock it's very worrying. And I will urge the, the finance ministry to take a very good model approach supporting farmers and also small holder, uh, small uh, skills enterprises in the agriculture sector. At least they should give them some additional stimulus package to, to go into production. Harvesting is taking place in some of the crop produce. Planting will soon start in other areas. They should at least motivate them to do the next season farming. All right, Yao, would you want to add something also with regards to the welfare of workers in times of this pandemic? Um, I think what could be done is to empower people to have alternative livelihood approaches. Yeah, so for instance, maybe training farmers on maybe soap production, for instance, maybe training farmers on maybe grass cutter rail, railing and bee farming so that people could have other means of income other than depending on, on only on their, on their mm -hmm. income in times of these crises. Yeah. And maybe just to add to what you also said, in such alternative livelihood programs, also it would be important that they are linked to markets so that these things are not produced without any, you know, one interested in, in buying them. And also consider things that could be produced locally without, uh, you know, uh, burdening the limited resources that, that we have already. I think there was also another question that 
wanted me to ask if any of the manifestos, you know, touches on food quality. Did, did you find something of that sort being, being a concern? And I add this to a question from Bennett Amwa who says, how are we doing well on machineries and innovation in relation to rice production that's quality versus quantity? So do we have anything also on, on quality as far as these two manifestos are concerned? For the MPP, not that I've, I've come across. They've not given any detail. They, they talked about agri uh, processing, adding value, but specifically talking about quality measures, I've not, I've not come across with that. Yeah. Neither do that of NDC also. Mm. That. They only mentioned about domestic rice production and, and they didn't really specify whether they would want to improve quality or the quantity that they want to produce. Yeah. That's what's in this. If, Vance, if, I, if I heard you right, you were saying something about machinery. Yes, there was a, 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 a commenter here who also wanted to find out how well we are doing on machineries and innovation. Well, in the NPP manifesto, as part of what they are doing currently, they've, they've said something about uh, giving inputs to five machinery centers that belongs to the Ministry of Food and Agriculture. And you know, it's our usual traditional trend, importation of tractors and small implements. But what I would love to see is empowering uh, already existing promising companies like Kantaka to produce uh, at least simple implement for our, our farmers that they can purchase with mm. a low price. Yes, and maybe also to Bennett Amwa, I would perhaps encourage you to check uh, other videos on um, agricultural technology where we look at how well we are doing as a country as far as this innovation and use of machines are, are concerned. So quickly, there are lots of messages and comments coming, but I think I'll read them later. So let's let's come back to, to, to the focus now. So we've seen the gaps. I mean, Yakubu, you've identified some, Safu, you've also done so. What actions, what actions do you think should be taken? I mean, regardless of whoever wins power, what actions would you hope that this is taken in order to improve our agricultural sector? Because this is a very important area for, for the country and our economy as well. I'll start with you again, Haruna Gado Yagubu. Thank yeah. you, Evans, and this will be my concluding remarks. And I urge my friend Isaac to listen to this very well. Evans, the impact of COVID-19 on world food basket is expected to be huge post-2020. We, we are already seeing the impact in Nigeria because seasonal farming across the globe will be affected. The shackles of the pandemic will affect the growth in agriculture sector and food price volatility is expected in most of the regions, especially in Africa. Even, even before COVID-19, agriculture gross value addition, uh, added growth rate in Ghana declined from 6.1 in 2017 to 4.6 in 2019. Sector share of the GDP declined from 21.2 in 2017 to 18.5 in 2019. So the impact on agriculture in 2020, 2021 would be very huge. These are my recommendations. We need bold and transformative leadership to aggressively implement the programs or projects outlined in their manifestos in order to overturn this trend. Public policy or good governance goes along with good politics. And I'll be giving a quote from Dr. Ngozi Nguela, who has given a very fantastic quote on how to implement these things. We have been shipping raw materials produced out of the country for a long time. We need to harness agri-processing in order to add value to our produce. And this will reveal the real potential of an agrarian economy like Ghana and that of West Africa region. We must develop comprehensive and to utilize the youth in agriculture development model of agriculture, turning them into assets and not liability. If you look at Ghana and even the larger continent, we have a lot of idle youth. The youth are idle and they don't know what to do. It is the duty of government to develop comprehensive plan, incorporate it into agrarian economy like that of Ghana and Africa in order to utilize them. We must harness the existing potential of ICT in agriculture in order to meet the demand of world economies. And when you look at what is currently affecting Nigeria, and Isaac wanted to know what Ghana as a nest, if you look at the West African region, Ghana and Nigeria are the two major countries. What we have to do 
is look at the gravity model of international trade. We should look at our distance, which is quite close, telling us that it is possible that their issues in terms of trade can be much observed in Ghana. If you look at what happened, the closure of border between Benin and Nigeria, we suffered a lot. So for now, West Africa leaders should come together to see how they can develop an economic plan to help Nigeria come out of this nemesis. They should activate the buffer, the West African buffer stock system in order to help Nigeria. Food price volatility is expected to increase more in the region. And therefore, if we cannot, we have a way, there is a channel to activate the World Food Program in, to come in support. When you are in terms, in, in, in situations like this, the World Food Program is ready to, 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 to support. Evans, my last conclusion, as I promised to quote Dr. Ngozi Nkonjo Iwila, good policies must be complemented with good politics. We can have it written in manifestos, but if the politics is bad, excessive partisanship, as we witness in countries like Ghana, where even planting for food and jobs, the distribution of input is given to party chairmen, secretaries, who are holding and smuggling out of the country, we can never achieve a very good agriculture development goal. Therefore, good policies, those who are implementing it, must be good politicians and must know the essence of politics in helping us. Evans, thank you, and thank you to SEPSA for this wonderful opportunity. Mm, thank you very much, uh, Haruna Gado Yakubu. Not so soon, we would come back to you to take your concluding remarks. But I guess this was for the agricultural sector because that will look at a different issue, though, something which is dear to, to Ghana as a country. But I like what you said. I mean, good policies must be complemented or coupled with good politics, the quotes which you read. And this answers one question from Bennett Amwa, who says, my problem is we keep talking about issues every year, but the problem still remains the same. So Bennett, I guess the answer is what is in the quote. I mean, we always have good policies, but perhaps it's not complemented with good politics. So maybe the way is to show them your thumb. I mean, vote wisely. I mean, I'm not doing politics here, though. But so for you, Haruna Gado Yakubu, the way to go would be mainly on leadership. This was your first point. If we have both, you know, and leaders who are willing to transform something, then we, we see that we can do. In addition to value addition, and also I like the gravity model of international trade that you brought. This is also very important. Since we can't produce everything, we should always you know, be aware of what we need and always fight for our interest. Thank you very much, um, Haruna Gado Yakubu. Yasafu, also for you, what do you think? Um, what actions do you feel could be put in place in order to help, you know, develop our agricultural sector very well? Evans, thank you very much. Um, in respect of the, of the higher demand and higher consumption of rice in Ghana, I think I think time has come for us to really have a look at rice production and establish maybe a board as we have with with cocoa board to oversee the production of rice and like rice related issues in order for the country to achieve self sufficiency and by doing so able to save a lot of money like in, in terms of foreign exchange and also employ a lot of people in the, in the process. So we need huge capital investment in the rice sector in, in the form of training farmers and also extension offices about the current technologies using rice production. And we should also focus on building processing plants in this rice, food, in this rice production areas so or districts and also link these um, products into the various market. For instance, we could use them for the school feeding program, for instance. And how do we incentivize farmers to get into rice production as we have in, in the cocoa sector? We could decide to offer them premium prices and also and provide free fertilizer and also agro inputs for farmers. And my next um, concern or suggestion is about the agricultural finance. I think we should have insurance schemes or policies for farmers 
these are done in developed countries and it helps to reduce agricultural risk. Agricultural production is very risky in our part of the world and normally people do not have access to credit and they also fear that once I sink my little money into this and there is no guarantee or there is no buffer in case something moves wrong, then you lose everything. So I think time has come for us to really focus on agricultural insurance and provide insurance for farmers. And with the, with the wider penetration of mobile phones, for instance, in Ghana, we could do this via mobile phone as we have digital credit in, in Ghana. So an insurance company could set up and offer these, these insurance schemes or packages via mobile phone. So you could register your mobile phone, maybe one acre of maybe farm or land, and you pay your money through that. And it's also possible to bundle these with credit products. Normally, banks and penetration in rural areas are very small, and the few banks in these areas really want to lend to small and medium enterprises because that is where they could recycle their loan within a very short time. So I think we could also have state banks with agricultural mandates into these rural areas, for instance, in each district, in order to serve the agricultural needs of farmers by offering them loans that are adaptable to the, the production specifics of farmers and not necessarily giving them repayment conditions that are not um, feasible when it comes to agricultural production. So I think these are my little submissions and I say thank you very much for the opportunity. Oh, not too far. Thank you also. Um, so for you, it's more still about uh, your strategy or what you would recommend is the rice production. You feel that it's an area that we have to, you know. Yeah, we have to really focus and also provide insurance for our farmers. Yes. And then also for your agricultural finance to allow insurance is to ensure that there is what insurance to be able yes. to mitigate some of the risk that farmers um, go go through. And you did mention of this strategy of the mobile, uh, if you could reiterate that this was not clear, what do you mean by the use of uh, mobile money? How do you use that to acquire insurance? This, this was not. Yeah, so um, an insurance company could maybe partner with the mobile network operator and sell the insurance package on the mobile phone. So if I'm a farmer in the village, I don't necessarily have to walk to a star assurance um, company in maybe Kumasi, but I could still borrow or purchase an insurance insurance policy via my mobile phone. And I think insurance market is something that we should really have a look and mm. try to develop it in order to make agricultural products and less. Mm. I mean, uh, th thank you very much, um, Yao. So our time is fast, and I have a few questions here. I would read, and then I would ask you guys to to comment on that. One from our own Albert. He says, "I feel the focus on agriculture had mainly been too subsistence, too subsistence, and not so focused on innovations to reduce the intensive and peasant nature of agriculture." And um, he goes on to say that his question is especially on commercial production diversification and food quality. I guess he's looking at whether the way to go is mechanization and commercialization or we still maintain at a subsistence level and also talking about issues of diversification. So that's one. And then the other one from Jesse Ampraku again, she says, my issue again is on endangered species. What are the manifesto saying? We keep hearing of rice, cocoa, et cetera, mostly cash crops. What about the local crops and products such as the baobab and tiger nut, dawa dawa? What are we doing about them? Are these parties thinking about other crops to boost the economy? So yes, I guess she's also talking about the, the endangered species or the crops that has been neglected. It, uh, are there any uh, hints on these crops? Do we have something like that in the manifestos and then the last one will be from 
Masisu Suali, he says, Masha Allah, brother, I guess. So, so gentlemen, just a comment on the two comments, one being the issue of commercialization, mechanization, and also diversification. And then the issue of these species that are being you know, neglected. What's your take on that? Okay, so to, to, to just address uh, Alves' concern, it's true that world economies are moving to commercialization of agriculture. But the major challenge in Ghana is that we still have this smaller unit of farming happening in the rural areas. And in some areas, though now we've achieved significant uh, electrification policy in Ghana, in some areas, it's still not up to tax for us to invent very serious uh, commercialization policies in agriculture, like climate smart agriculture. I agree, we should consider those in the urban areas where we can have larger unit to start. But with the smaller areas, we can still motivate them through smaller implements that I was talking about and also through the subsidy policies. If you look at the question about domestic crops, it's true. When you look at the NPP manifesto, just last two, two months or so, the president inaugurated the three crops authority and they are considering six crops to the best of my, my yeah, six crops, mango, cashew, and those other uh, Across, they never mentioned something like the barba or the dada and those and those things. So largely, the domestic crops are not being considered, as I I, I can remember. Thank you very much, Yasafu. You also want to add to the issue of um, mechanization and also the neglect of other local crops. Thank you. Um, in respect of the agricultural mechanization, as already indicated by Mr. Haruna. I think the challenge is with the land tenure system in our in our um, localities or in our rural areas. So the land parcels are being distributed among so many families that makes it very difficult for people to come together in order to engage in mechanized um, cropping. So for now, I think it's, it's, it's something that maybe the government could take up. Initially, we used to have state-owned farms like, for instance, if you go to a drug, they had a farm for maize production. Yeah, so I think we can focus on that, especially the key crops, maybe, for instance, maybe maize that we really use it in large quantities. But for the, the other crops, especially in rural areas, I think it's, it's a bit difficult. And in respect of um, conservation of um, animals, like, sorry, no, the, the, other, the other point was to, I mean, the commenter was asking whether the manifestos also touched on the underutilized or underused crops. I mean, what, what's your take on that? Mm, I think the NDC did mention of CNAT and I think Kashi and also Cotton, like that they will work with stakeholders to develop reliable markets for these primary products. Mm. But I think it's, it's just a minor comment and yeah. yeah so. Anyway, thank you very much. And I also have to say thank you to Jesse who brought that angle in. I think it's a very important area that should be looked at. There are so many species that are going extinct, I guess, because we stopped consuming them or we, we have perhaps branded them to be inferior or, or numerous reasons and we probably would have to go back to look at these underutilized and underused crops to see how best they could help boost our local economies. So thank you very much, Mr. Yao Safu. Thank you very much, Harona Gado Yakubu. So I'll not allow you to go. I know time is far spent, but we are, we are just a few days away to election 2020. And I would like to hear from you, your message, you know, to, to Ghanaians who are watching now, fellow sub Syrians who are watching, especially those in Ghana, what would you say to them in order to observe a peaceful elections, you know, not only before the elections, but also during and after the elections? I'll start with you again, Yakubu. Thank you, uh, Evans. Evans, the, in the, uh, post, if you look at the prospect of every economy, it depends on the youth. I urge my colleagues to see this election nearing campaign as exchange of ideas and believing in certain ideologies. You can be left wing, you can be right wing. It should not be a form of fight between us. We should stop attacking each other, especially using social media bullying. 
And again, I urge them to contribute their quota by way of just sharing their messages to other people to adopt it. In case of agriculture, I'll be biased here again. The good policies in place for every government, they must have something I called mid assessment. They should assess them and look at how to review them to bring back life to them. You can have good intentions, but when you are implementing, you will see the challenges and you try to correct them. I wish all the two major political parties well. And on December 7th, I pray that what happened in Ayawasu will not be repeated across the country. I wish the country very well. I love Ghana so much. Well said, I love Ghana as well. Mr. Ayasa, for your concluding remarks. Um, and thank you. I think we've come too far to turn back now as a country. We are one of the most stable um, democracies in Africa. So we would want that, th that to continue. So I urge my fellow Ghanaians to observe peace before, during, and after the elections and whoever emerges the winner should be accepted in good faith and let's all live in peace. Good luck to all the political parties and whoever comes up as a winner we accept and wish that political party the best of luck. Thank Great. You. So thank you very much. And um, to our fellow Subsyrians, this has been Sepsa Talk. Today we looked at, again, interrogating the manifestos that focus on agriculture and agribusiness. And we've seen that there are a lot that can be done to help transform our sector, but it is just not beyond us. And I still like the quote by Haru Nagadu from one in Gozi that, once we have good policies, it appears the policies are good, but indeed we need good politicians, people who have the political will, people who mean well to be able to transform the economy. Thank you very much. I am Evans Apia Kisi, the host of Sepsa Talk. We bring you another interesting discussion next week. Thank you and have a lovely day, evening, afternoon, wherever you are. Bye-bye.